Metropolitan Benjamin of Petrograd. The Vicar Bishop Benjamin, having been elected to the rank of Metropolitan by a majority vote of the people of Petrograd, including the workers, was appointed as Metropolitan of Petrograd in the summer of 1917, during the period of the Dumas so-called provisional government. The, the citizens had known Metropolitan Benjamin for a long time and they were deeply attached to him because of his kindness and simplicity, his constant cordiality and concern for his parish and the needs of its individual members. If, during this troubled time, there was a sincerely non-political man in Russia, it was Metropolitan Benjamin. His disregard for politics was natural. It did not result from some inner struggle or spiritual conflicts. He ignored politics in all his personal or, pub or public activities. He was the man who, as head of the Petrograd diocese, had to face the, con the confiscation of church valuables, an act which had already been smeared with pools of human blood. The confiscation of church val uh, valuables by the communists began in Petrograd in the middle of March 1922. It was carried out under the pretext of assisting the Russian population, which was actually starving at, at the time. Thus, for the sake of the people, Metropolitan Benjamin did not object. He considered any sacrifice justified, even if only to save one human being from famine and death. He went even further than the Patriarch himself in consenting to, to surrender the holy vessels of the churches in order to carry out the fulfillment of human and Christian duty. He, he intended the surrender of valuables, however, to be voluntary, not enforced. Force was unnecessary and, and an insult to those who were performing an act of kindness. He firmly believed that the people should have control over the spending of the donations. The many previous riots in other towns had been caused by lack of trust in the communist government. The communists might intrude on the religious, but they, the communists might intrude on the religious. They might rob them of all that was sacred and had, be, and had beautified the churches for centuries. But the people were under no illusion that the communists would spend one penny on the of the confiscated treasures for their claimed humane intent. Metropolitan Benjamin, foreseeing that Petrograd might also suffer, thought it wise for the parishioners to control the donations. He could not bless the confiscation of the holy utensils, viewing it to be sacrilegious. But to bless, but to bless the voluntary donations was a different thing. In fact, it would be his sacred duty as the head of the diocese. The distrust of the masses would disappear with the consent of the communist authorities to the donations and control, and the intention to assist the starving people would assume first importance. Metropolitan Benjamin believed this could be achieved because it would benefit the communist government, which would then be able to carry out confiscation without meeting any opposition or causing any trouble. In the beginning, the Petrograd communists had adopted a concili conciliatory attitude merely having in mind the appropriation of church treasures. On March 6, 1922, Metropolitan Benjamin was therefore invited to the com commission of, so, of quote, help to the starving, end quote. He was favorably received and his propositions with regard to the voluntary donations and the control of funds raised by representatives of the various parishes were found acceptable. The general atmosphere was so friendly that the Metropolitan blessed everybody and with tears in his eyes declared that he would be ready to remove with his own hands the precious silver vestment, uh, vestment from the icon of the Holy Virgin of Kazan and give it to his starving brothers. The newspapers, including Izvestia of Moscow, published the concluded agreement. Press comments favoured the Metropolitan and the Petrograd clergy, approving their sincere desire and readiness to fulfil their civic duty for charity. But the Moscow Centre disapproved of the action of the Petrograd communists, who apparently had misunderstood the real aim of the proletariat's attack on the church wealth. The voluntary donations would raise the prestige of the clergy, which was undesirable for the Communist Party. They did not want cooperation. They wanted a split. They did not want peace, they wanted war. Such was the motto of the Communist Party, which was not yet suspected by the committee. When the Metropolitan's representatives went to the committee several days later, they were curtly told that there could be no question of donations or control by the members of the church over the distribution of the church wealth. The valuables would be confiscated by the government in the regular way. The confiscation of property started in the small churches of Petrograd, Angry crowds gathered near the churches, expressing 
indignation and shouting protests against the communists and the trader priests who cooperated with them. At times, they threw stones at the communist agents and even administered beatings, but as nothing critical happened, the authorities did not find it necessary to interfere. Yet the day of the confiscation of the great church treasures was approaching. The communists were preparing some extra measures. The population of the city was restless, for trouble was brewing. At that time, no one had yet thought of the possibility of a split in the ranks of the clergy. Differences of opinion did exist, and one could sense a restless element among some of the clergy. Some might go over to the communist side, but such turncoats were few and weak, and nobody took them seriously. On March 24, 1922, the Petrograd newspaper Pravda published a, a letter bearing 12 signatures, which belonged for the most part to the future pillars of the dissent, called by the communists the living church. The authors of the letter proclaimed themselves to be definitely separated from the rest of the clergy. They accused them of playing politics and being counter-revolutionaries and even held them responsible for the famine. They insisted on, on immediate confiscation of all church valuables or their unconditional surrender to the Soviet authorities. The Petrograd clergy were shocked and angered upon reading the letter of the so, of the so-called Twelve and rightly understood the letter to be, to be a political denouncement. With his usual poise, the Metropolitan tried to subdue their anger. The important thing for him was to avert bloody encounters between the people and the agents of the power. There was no time to lose. From day to day, the situation was becoming more tense. It was then decided to try once more to talk things over with the authorities. That task was entrusted to Vedensky and Boyarsky, two of the 12 who were now in favor with the communist government. The choice was justified by the results, for the new messengers soon succeeded in reaching an agreement. Their greatest achievement had been obtaining permission to substitute, their, uh, to substitute other possessions of the same value for the sacred objects. The Metropolitan promised to address the people with a suitable appeal. Although he was not renouncing his true convictions and principles, he entreated the people not to resist the authorities, but to surrender the valuables in the event of enforced confiscation. The appropriation of the treasures was, in the end, so successful that the head of the local militia was obliged to state in his official report that the campaign had been a great success and had ended quite peacefully. The storm occurred nevertheless, though for entirely different reasons. Vedensky and Boyarsky and some others, uh, and some others neither could nor would stop there and then. Prompted by the Soviet authorities, who were ready to cooperate with them, they had a tremendous project in view, the usurpation of the church power in order to use it according to their will under the protection of the communist government. In the beginning of May, a rumor spread in Petrograd of a revolution in church of, of a revolution in church affairs accomplished by the above mentioned group. Patriarch Tikhon, according to the rumor, had been denied power, had been denied power in church matters. Vedensky appeared in Petrograd, went to the Metropolitan and, inf and informed him of the revolution. He declared that a new church government had been established, appointing him, Vedensky, its delegate in the, in the Petrograd diocese. The Metropolitan could be very accommodating when it, was, when it was merely a question of church valuables. But after meeting face to face with one of the usurpers of the church's power, the Metropolitan understood that a wave of revolt already threatened the church and true religion. Next day, the Metropolitan issued a decree which placed Vedensky outside of the Russian Orthodox Church, explaining all the reasons that prompted the order. But he mentioned that the expulsion could be regarded as just a temporary measure until Vedensky admitted his error and renounced it. The Metropolitan's order was immediately printed in all Soviet newspapers. Needless to say, it caused surprise and fury among the communists. In a few days, Vedensky, in the company of the Petrograd Commandant Bakayev, appeared before the Metropolitan and brought him an ultimatum. The Metropolitan had to choose, either to revoke his order concerning Vedensky or, or be ready for court procedure against himself and many other clergymen in connection with the confiscation of the church treasures. He was warned that on his, that he was warned that on his choice would depend whether or not he himself would be put to death along with other persons nearest to him. The Metropolitan listened calmly to the threats and definitely refused to submit. 
When Videnski and Bekayev left, the Metropolitan well understood that their threats were in earnest, that when he had decided to cross them in their plans to establish a revolutionary church, destroying true religion, he had condemned himself to death, but he could not and would not abandon his chosen path. Foreseeing the approach of his martyrdom, he prepared for what fate seemed to have in store for him by giving his last orders to the diocese, arranging last meetings with friends and saying his farewells. A few days later, returning to the, to the Lavra from a short trip, he found certain guests in his quarters, the examining magistrate, numerous agents of the Cheka and guards. Their long and very detailed search of his rooms had proved fruitless, so they accused the Metropolitan and some others of resisting the confiscation of church valuables. He was put under house arrest and after a few days was taken to prison where he remained until, until the hour of his death. The affair was conducted as all Soviet justice was then administered. This monstrous suit caused great excitement throughout the city. In the first place, there was the problem of arranging the defense of the Metropolitan. Some organizations and societies wanted to entrust it to the former popular, popular barrister J.S. Gurevich, a man who, since the communists had come to power, had quit the bar and did not participate in the Soviet courts. Gurevich hesitated and mentioned one objection to his consent, his Jewish nationality. No one, he pointed out, could be insured against making occasional mistakes, and a Russian barrister would not be blamed for them, but a Jewish legal counsel would be, no matter how honest he might be. All doubts and discussions were suddenly ended when the Metropolitan, from prison, asked Gurevich to assume the responsibility of the defence, urging him urging him to accept it without hesitation and adding that he trusted him completely. When Metropolitan Benjamin entered the courtroom in his Episcopal attire with his crozier in his hand, followed by Bishop Benedict, other members of the clergy and some civilian prisoners, all those who were present rose from their seats and watched the group in dead silence. The Metropolitan blessed them all. The judge began the questioning with their usual treacherous methods trying to trap the Metropolitan and force and force him to tell who had, inspired, who had inspired and who had formulated the proposition which he had given to the Commission of Help to the Starving. Open hints were given to the Metropolitan that he could save himself by simply naming the authors or even by renouncing the context of his own proposition. To send Metropolitan Benjamin to a firing squad for the courage of his convictions would present a certain kind of in inconvenience for the communists and would embarrass them. But to show him to the masses, in quotes, repenting, humiliated, morally degraded, as one who had completely surrendered his opinions to the orders of the authorities, that would be a Soviet victory over the church. The Metropolitan pretended not to notice the life belts offered him and looking straight into the faces of the judges, repeated firmly, I alone did it. I thought everything over. I formulated, wrote, and sent the proposition myself. I did not allow anybody else to participate in deciding the matters entrusted to me as archpastor. These words, of course, pronounced, pronounced his doom. Everyone present in the courtroom realized his courage and the greatness of his soul as he thus sought to protect the others. His interrogation ended, the Metropolitan, with dignity and, and serenity of expression, amidst the sighs and suppressed sobs of those present, returned to his chair. Only one man among the prosecutors dared, at the beginning of the trial, to use a contemptuous tone when addressing the Metropolitan. The defence lawyer, Gurevich, protested sharply against this disrespectful attitude. The other defendants, the clergy and the civilians, in general remained calm and did not try to seek favours from their judges. There were no cases of slander, denunciation, or insinuations. No one wanted to accuse another in order to mitigate his own fate. Most of the defendants behaved with dignity, some of them showing real heroism in openly agreeing with the Metropolitan's point of view. The trial lasted for two weeks, and then the tribunal began to call the witnesses, among them being a certain Krasnitsky, who was dressed in a priest cassock, a supporter of the living church. This man was obviously a paid official armed with false accusations, shameless lies and generalizations. In his frenzy to destroy the innocent and unjustly accused prisoners, he had surpassed even the members of the court. He seemed to be a true Judas. 
Even the members of the tribunal lowered their eyes uncomfortably during his testimony. The priest Boyarsky was the next to testify. He was one of the 12 who had signed the letter published in Pravda. An experienced orator and popular preacher, he proved to be a disappointment to the, to the prosecution, for his speech was an ardent apology for the Metropolitan and made a great impression on everyone present. The next witness, Egorov, a professor of the Technological Institute, explained in detail the Metropolitan's negotiations with the Commission. His truthful speech completely eradicated the previous counts of the indictment, whereupon the prosecutor promptly accused Egorov of being an adherent of the Metropolitan and ordered his immediate arrest. Thus, Egorov was added to the other prisoners. Such is the status of a witness in the Soviet court. The government did not take time to prepare the case. It would only conduct a mock trial, which would be swiftly disposed of in a, in a predetermined manner. The result, always the same, favorable to the Soviet government. The word defense was but a hollow mockery, for there was and is only prosecution. As the prosecutor ended the trial and shouted his indictment, nothing else could be understood except that he was asking for 16 heads. A group of people in the courtroom, appointed especially for the purpose and strengthened by several hundred Red soldiers, dutifully responded with loud applause. Members of the Red Army with their commanding officers occupied the balcony. Then the stand was given to the defense lawyer, Gurevich. At the beginning of his speech, Gurevich pointed out that the prosecution was trying to justify the accusation in terms of history and politics, subjects having no connection with the trial. He asserted that the charge was being automatically connected with all kinds of protocols and red tape, facts and time having nothing in common with the case. Then Gurevich related in detail the cause and history of the origin of the trial. He pointed out that Metropolitan Benjamin, during the trying hours of the investigation, did not weaken in his stand. You can destroy the Metropolitan, but you have no power to destroy his spiritual strength and the, and the nobility and loftiness of his thoughts and actions, said Gurevich. Concluding his speech, Gurevich said, how will this trial end and what will history say about it? History will record that during the spring of 1922, priceless treasures were confiscated from the churches of Petrograd by the Soviets. That according to the Soviet reports, everything, everything had been done without serious interference or public protest. Will it add that despite this, the Soviet powers, to the indignation of the whole civilized world, still considered it necessary to line up the Metropolitan and, and others before a firing squad? I ask nothing of you. I know pleas are useless. Only political ma matters come first with you, and all verdicts must favor your policy. Any obstacle must be ruthlessly removed. Will you dare to apply such procedure to this case, a case which is of supreme importance to us? Will you dare to admit to the whole world that this court trial is nothing but a mockery? In any case, do not make a martyr of the Metropolitan. The masses revere him, and if he is killed for his faith and his loyalty to the masses, he would become much more dangerous to the Soviet power. The immutable law of history should be a warning. Let it remind you that, that true faith feeds and grows strong on the blood of martyrs. Would you risk, would you risk giving more martyrs to the restless people? Before his speech, the defense before his speech, the defense lawyer had warned the public to remain calm and to refrain from expressing its emotions for the benefit of the accused as well as for its own sake, because the public might also be subjected to punishment. Nevertheless, the conclusion of the speech was followed by a storm of applause which lasted for a long time. The tribunal, greatly displeased, tried to take some measures. But it happened that many communists occupying a large part of the courtroom joined in the ovation. This was explained by the fact that many of the communists from the masses did not approve of the trial. The debates ended and the final word was given to the defendants. Stenographers were not allowed to take down the words of the defendants, for the communists did not want to record the last words of the doomed, lest the people re recreate the tragic hour later. Metropolitan Benjamin rose slowly from his seat his tall figure clearly outlined against the light. Silence reigned in the courtroom. The Metropolitan first expressed his sorrow at being called the enemy of the people. I am a true son of my people, he said. I love and always have loved the people. I have dedicated my whole life to them and I felt happy to see that they, I mean the common people, repaid me with the same kind of love. 
It was the Russian people who raised me to the high position I have been occupying in our Russian church. This was all that he had to save himself. The rest of his speech dealt with explanations and considerations for the defence of others. Referring to some written documents and other facts, he exhibited extraordinary memory, logic and calmness. A reverent silence followed the concluding words of the Metropolitan speech, which was broken by the presiding judge. He addressed the Metropolitan in a gentler tone of voice than before, as if he was also affected by the spiritual strength of the defendant. All this time, he said, you have spoken about others. The tribunal would like to hear about yourself. The Metropolitan, who had sat down, rose, looked at the presiding judge, puzzled, and asked in a low, clear voice, about myself? But what else can I tell you about myself? One more thing, perhaps. Regardless of what my sentence will be, no matter what you decide, life or death, death, I will lift up my eyes reverently to God, cross myself and affirm, glory to thee, my Lord, glory to thee for everything. And these were to be the last words of Metropolitan Benjamin. At this point, the tribunal declared a recess. Another defendant, Archimandrite Sergi, left a deep impression on the people. He drew a picture of the ascetic life of a monk and stressed the fact that, renouncing the world with its distractions and worries, dedicating himself to religious meditation and prayers, he maintained only flimsy ties with the outside world. Could it be, he asked, that this tribunal thinks that breaking the feeble thread connecting me with life could frighten me? Do your deed. I pity you and pray for you. At nine o'clock in the evening of July 5th, the tribunal emerged from the council room and the chairman announced the following verdict. Ten persons, including the Metropolitan, were condemned to be shot. No one was surprised and the red balcony applauded the verdict. Long and wearisome days followed. The lawyers were busy with appeals, trips to Moscow and serving petitions for mercy to the Central Communist Party. On Monday, August 14, 1922, the persons who appeared regularly at the prison with their usual parcels of food for the condemned were told that the prisoners had been sent to Moscow. Familiar with the Soviet phraseology, they understood all too well the meaning of those terrible words. Actually, the prisoners had been taken out of prison and shot at a distance of only a few miles from Petrograd. Before the execution, they had been shaved and dressed in rags so that the firing squad would not know that they were executing clergymen. Father Sergi prayed aloud, O oh Lord, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Kov Shorov mocked and laughed at the executioners. Novitsky, Novitsky wept, thinking of his young orphan daughter, and begged that his silver watch and lock of grey hair be given to her as his last, last gift. Metropolitan Benjamin went to his death calmly, whispering a prayer and crossing himself. Thus died these men. For a long time, the population refused to believe that Metropolitan Benjamin was dead. Different stories arose. It was rumoured that the Metropolitan had been imprisoned in some remote secret place. Rumours were strengthened because no official information about the executions had been given out. In the minds of many, the Metropolitan still lived, and his image glowed in their hearts, even as the cherished memory of him lives today. And that's the end of this chapter. And again, did your grace have any thoughts to share? The life of Metropolitan Benjamin is very inspiring. Um, his calmness in the face of total chaos in the formation of the Soviet Union and the rule of uh, communism, uh, his strength of character. Uh, he's one of those saints that you can't say enough about um, standing by his flock, insisting that he was the servant of his flock and that the Russian people truly wanted him. Uh, but that was nothing in the eyes of, of the godless. I'm just wondering why the Soviet authorities went through the sh sham trials, really, because that's all they were. They were always going to find the clergy guilty. Um, so what was the point of that? Was that just, you know, to sort of pacify the followers um, of the church or, or what? Because I'm just puzzled about that. What, why, 
why it's, it was just a charade. So, um, and with others, they, they didn't appear to go through that process. They were just murdered unceremoniously, um, you know, for example, with um, St Elizabeth and her family. So, and did that just apply to the high-ranking members of the clergy? It was the desire of the communists to appear official. Um, even in the civil war here in Greece, uh, they had these uh, mock trials that could happen in any field and on any square and no official biz, uh, building at all even. And they would show that they were very just people because they had trials for all these people that they killed. So it, it's trying to, it's actually making fun of the, the simpler people, but it's trying to say that we do things officially. But as you said, Anna, it, it wasn't always done that way. It depends on what, uh, what reaction they thought they would get or if they could even justify bringing someone to trial like St. Elizabeth, I'm sure that uh, a trial would have made it a lot worse. It would have made people realize how very unjust they were because she never did anything against um, the Russian people.